please check out my revised website at creationsciencefiction.com. It's a great resource now for answering creationist claims. There's also documentaries, lectures, my blog, and more. Like my Facebook page, too. And if you want to support what I'm doing, you can become a contributor at patreon.com. In this video, we're going to take a look at what Dr. Todd Wood, a young earth creationist, says about human origins. Dr. Wood was featured in the 2017 Christian film, Is Genesis History? This lecture was recorded in 2017 and is on the Is Genesis History YouTube page. He's also president of the Core Academy of Science, a small creationist organization out of Dayton, Tennessee. Todd also has a blog page where he said this about the evidence for evolution. Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It is not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it. It is not just speculation or a faith choice or an assumption or a religion. It is a productive framework for lots and lots of biological research, and it has amazing explanatory power. There is no conspiracy to hide the truth about the failure of evolution. There has really been no failure of evolution as a scientific theory. It works, and it works well. I'll put a link to this page in the video description. You see, Todd Wood doesn't deny there is evidence for human evolution, but we're going to take a look at what he does with that evidence in this two-part series. And I'm very happy to have an opportunity to share with you uh, my research on human origins, specifically uh, human fossils. Uh, let's begin here just by taking a look at what the scripture has to say about this subject. Uh, this was a 47-minute lecture, so we're going to skip the scriptural part and go ahead to where he starts talking about the evidence for human origins. As people began exploring the world and finding other people, groups, and tribes all around the world, people were already then beginning to wonder, is, were there other people alive at the time of Adam? Is Adam really the progenitor of all people today? Uh, this is not a new debate. And basically, the problem was there's too much variability for human beings to be all related to Adam and Eve, and there's not enough time to produce that variability. That's basically uh, the argument that's going on today. There are, however, other things that have led to people believing that we did not come from an original couple. We actually evolved from animals. And that other thing is the fossil record. So to help me explain that, I brought some of my friends. Uh, uh, entire series of fossils. This is just a small sample of the hominin fossil record, together with a modern chimpanzee over here. We'll use him for reference. It looks a lot like the display I use at our local museum to teach human evolution, and he even uses a lot of the same fossils. I'm going to take some time now to sort of walk through each individual fossil that I've got here and try to explain uh, the significance of it and what it means. He starts with Artipithecus here and spends about the next 15 minutes going over each skull in order from oldest to youngest, showing the smaller cranial capacity, evolving into larger cranial capacity. It actually does a, a pretty good job of presenting the evidence for human evolution from ape to modern human. He talks mostly about skull features, though, and he doesn't feature Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy species, and he skips over other parts of human anatomy besides the skull. He also skips over the Demonisi skulls, which he has on the table, but he brings them up later, as we'll see. So, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, my strategy. Um, coming into the world of creation research, I was very interested in understanding um, the origins and the created kinds of people. 
but I knew that we didn't really have good ways of doing that. Uh, so I wanted to be able to develop a methodology that would allow me to analyze these things and make some conclusions. In other words, he recognizes that the evidence for human evolution is clear, but he needs to come up with some way to make it fit a young Earth worldview. So let's have a look at what I found. When you take these fossils and you put them onto an evolutionary tree, this is what you get. These are color-coded according to genus, roughly. Uh, the yellow is Homo, the green is Australopithecus, red is Paranthropus, which is this guy, the black skull, and then the blue is everything else. In my opinion, Paranthropus is an offshoot and doesn't really need to be on that chart, but it does disrupt the nice flow in his chart. It throws something in between Australopithecus afarensis and Africanus. This diagram also shows you, in addition to their relationships on the evolutionary tree, the little bars here represent the range of dates that they have been found. So you can appreciate, hopefully, how this phylogeny, the evolutionary tree here, seems to follow along pretty well, not exactly, not perfectly, but pretty well, with the appearance in the fossil record. Things that are old, tend to be down here on this end of the tree. Things that are young tend to be over on this end of the tree. And there is Homo sapiens. That's us. Now I would like anyone who's still a young Earth creationist and who's watching this to please listen to what he says next. So, before we talk about my results, I want to emphasize something here. When you look at this array of fossils, and you think about the similarities and the story that I just told you about them, I hope you can appreciate human evolution is not stupid. People don't believe this because they're dumb and don't know any better. People believe this because, well, yeah, I mean, look at this. There's an evolutionary tree made from morphology. It matches up nicely with the dates in the fossil record, which is radioisotope stuff and has nothing to do with the shape of the skull. This, these, these animals show a gradual progression that becomes, seems to become more human. Culturally, they seem to become more human the farther you, closer you get up to that end of the tree. Human evolution isn't stupid. And we must not ever, ever underestimate the science. You hear that, Kent Hovind? Maybe it's because this guy has a real doctorate and he's actually studied the evidence that he realizes this. We're the, we're the folks who believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate and the evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. We should never underestimate evolutionary biologists who study this. The minute you think that you're smarter than they are, oh, pride goes before a fall. <laughs> God is going to humble you. So remember that. Human evolution isn't stupid. But that don't mean it's untouchable either. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what is this, an honest young earth creationist? Well, not exactly. Remember, he needs to come up with a strategy to deal with the evidence. So is there another way to examine this. Well, first of all, we're going to have to think for a second here, what exactly is human? In other words, what does it mean to be descended from Adam and Eve? For a long time, going way back before Darwin even, people thought what is human is what looks like me. I am human. And therefore, if you don't look like me, you're probably not human. This is actually a documented psychological phenomenon. It's called dehumanization. You can see it uh, in people's attitudes towards other people from different regions of the same country. If you show a group of college students photographs and ask them 
what the person is thinking, they will be more willing to tell you what they think they're thinking if you tell them they come from the same place you do than if they, you tell them they come from someplace else. Seems crazy, doesn't it? But we all do it. We dehumanize people that don't look or act like we do. You know, this guy presents an interesting lecture, and he really knows his facts. So I can't help think that if he would drop the religious part, he could be a great human origins professor. And that is a brain thing. That is a psychological thing. We all have it, and we got to beware. We cannot come to the fossil record and just say, this looks like me. It must be human. That does not look like me. It's not human. That's a bad way of doing things. We need something better than that. So how do we tell the difference between human and non-human? Well, the methodology that I've developed uh, looks at similarities and differences among the fossils. I begin with the characters used to make this evolutionary tree right here, this one. And I summarize those characteristics, and I should say there are hundreds of them that went into this diagram, and more than 400, I'm pretty sure, and um, they're all mostly craniodental. They're from the skull and the teeth. So I can take those characters, I can summarize them as differences. How many characters does this guy share with this guy? And given that I am comparing so many hundred characters, what percentage of characters are they different by? Okay, put down the chimp skull. He doesn't belong in this conversation. You're starting to lose me here. And when I do that, I'm going to get a massive distance matrix that will tell me how similar any one pair is to anything else. And lo and behold, this is what I find. Here we have a nice cluster of Homo over here, Paranthropus over here, Australopithecus and over here living apes. What you should notice here is that there is a big giant gap between this cluster and all these other guys. And that's not just an artifact of the diagram. It's really there. It's a real hard gap between them. I really wish I knew all the data he was putting in to come up with this chart because the gap between Australopithecus and what we consider early Homo really isn't that large. We also don't know what Homo erectus fossils he used and whether he included the Demonisi skulls. Now you might say, well, that's because you haven't got enough fossils. Eventually you're going to find the fossils that bridge the gap. And I say, great, bring it on. And in fact, that's exactly what's happened. So literally, while I was waiting to hear back on the editorial decision for my first paper where I described this research, this fossil was described from South Africa. I remember it quite vividly. This is a representation, a model of Australopithecus sediba. And I was thrilled. I thought, that's perfect. Now I have another thing to test. My paper had been written up. I said, look, homo is human. Anything that's homo is human. Anything that's not is not human. And now I had this guy to test it out. Australopithecus sediba was discovered by Matthew Berger, son of paleoanthropologist Lee Berger, in 2008. The paper announcing it was published in 2010. Now, the papers that Dr. Wood is talking about aren't scientific papers that he's publishing in scientific journals. They're being published in creationist journals. And the question that we need to think about here when we're dealing with this kind of cluster analysis, are new fossils like this going to bridge the gap between homo and non-homo, 
or will it fall into one of the existing clusters? So in other words, is Sediba going to show up down here with other australopiths? Or is it going to show up right here in the gap between and cause the entire clusters to collapse, connecting things like humans to things that are pretty much not human? And I think you can tell that seems pretty significant, right? Because if this fossil bridges that gap, then there seems to be some evidence of one cluster that includes humans and non-humans. That would be very favorable to an evolutionary perspective. On the other hand, if it shows up in a separate cluster, then that would continue to be consistent with a creationist idea that there is human and there is not human, and we can tell the difference. Now, just looking at this guy, it wasn't obvious to me at all what I was looking at. But given that it was called Australopithecus sediba, I was pretty sure it was going to end up right here with the other Australopiths. And guess what I found? That stubborn thing is right there right in the middle of the cluster of Homo. Over here, living apes. Over here, other Australopiths. Up here, Paranthropus. And right here is the Homo cluster, and right there is Sediba. And no matter how many times I run the analysis, no matter how many times I fiddled with the characters, fiddled with the sample of, um, the sample of taxa, that I was using, the different fossils, Australopithecus sediba consistently grouped with humans. Now you can imagine this was warmly received by creationists everywhere. But that's science, right? I can't, I guess I could go back and continue to manipulate the data and decide that it must be all wrong and my methods must be totally bogus. Or I could just say, well, you know what? The more important thing here is that big test, right? The more important thing here is that there's still a gap. Sediba did not fall in this gap. In fact, it fell far from the gap on the other side of the Homo cluster. Okay, now think about this for a minute. If members of Australopithecus are now grouped with members of genus Homo, where's the gap? There's no gap at all. Okay, so that's awkward. Granted, would have been nice if it was some other direction. Be nice to be the hero for creationism one time, but I'll just have to be the whipping boy. That's fine. So what about Homo naledi? What about all the variation in those Demonese skulls? Did he ever find Adam and Eve? We'll find out in part two coming soon.